an unexpected blockbuster new book by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI was released posthumously this week, entitled What is Christianity? It's currently only in Italian, but in it, the late pontiff examines the current state of the church and makes some startling observations, while the current pope sits for an interview with the Associated Press. With analysis of all these stories and more, I'm joined by canon lawyer, priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Father, thank you for being here. I want to begin with the late Pope Benedict's book. Now, look, the deal was it could only be released after he died because, it, and I'm paraphrasing here in his words, there would be a, a titanic reaction because of what happened when he released that book with Cardinal Sarah on priestly celibacy. He claims he didn't want to put himself or Christendom through that. Thus, the posthumous book, Classic Benedict. Uh, your thoughts on the timing of the release of this book? Well, this is the fruit of 10 years of prayer and study. Remember, he said he wanted to write after he left the pontificate. Mm. So now we're going to get to see those writings. One of them has already been published in the German magazine. That was his reflections on the sexual abuse crisis. Uh, so I'm looking forward to right. the other essays. But I, it's considerate of him uh, to wait until after his death to publish them, because now there's no longer... Uh, this idea that, you know, there's a conflict here between the former pope and the pope. Now this is simply his reflections uh, that he's leaving for the whole church to uh, meditate on. Hmm. Here's some of what Benedict writes. And this is about the breakdown in seminary formation after Vatican II. He writes, in several seminaries, homosexual clubs were formed that more or less openly and clearly transformed the climate of the seminaries. One bishop, who had previously been a rector, had allowed pornographic films to be shown to seminarians, allegedly with the intent of thereby empowering them to resist against behavior contrary to the faith. He goes on to write that in many seminaries of the day, his own books, as Ratzinger, were considered harmful literature, and seminarians caught reading them were actually deemed unfit. Father Jerry, what does it say about the bishops in charge of these seminaries and dioceses and their belief in church teaching and practice? Well, that's an accurate indictment, and that did happen. That was a famous case in the United States. That was Bishop Ken Utner. Uh, and at the time when this was first revealed, uh, you know, he was Rome looked at him again and then they finally approved him. But uh, I think that was a mistake. Showing pornography to seminarians should immediately disqualify you from being a rector of a seminary, let alone a bishop of a diocese. And then homosexual clubs, uh, you know, people have same sex attraction, same sex attraction. Uh, are not suitable, according to the Vatican, uh, to become priests. And the reason is that their effective life has such deficiencies and it poses a temptation for them and to others in the seminary. Uh, and we've seen that. How many mm. cases do we have uh, that have been reported over the last 20 years of priests who became active homosexuals and it started in the seminary? This is not a good uh, uh, thing for the church. It needs to be rooted out. People of homosexual attraction need pastoral care but they don't need to be made priests. Pope Benedict also addresses the current state of the West. I want your reaction to this. He says, the modern Western world state, on the one hand, sees itself as a great power of tolerance that breaks with the foolish and pre-rational traditions of all religions. Uh, moreover, with its radical manipulation of man and the twisting of the sexes through gender ideology, it stands in particular opposition to Christianity. Father Jerry, um, this pope, uh, Pope Benedict, spoke so often of the dictatorship of relativism. Uh, your reaction to this, which touches on the same subject matter. Absolutely the case. Remember with the Obama administration trying to force the Little Sisters of the Poor to provide abortion coverage in the health care plan they gave their employees? Uh, that was mm. the use of government power to compel people to reject their religion. Uh, similar things are going on all the time. Catholicism is called bigotry because of our teaching on sexual morality. No, in a free society, Religious people enjoy the same rights as non-religious people and should not be subject to government pressure. We see that all the time. Uh, it's a big problem now, this transgender thing, trying to force Catholic schools and others through different 
uh, laws and regulations, uh, to participate in things that are immoral and don't make sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was a prophet. Pope Benedict definitely was a prophet. Uh, Benedict XVI also addresses the politicization that he says is operating in the church today. He, he writes, in fact, today the church is largely seen only as a kind of political apparatus. In fact, it is spoken of only using political categories. And that is true even of bishops who formulate their idea about the church of tomorrow largely, almost exclusively in political terms. Now, Father Jerry, uh, th this could apply to what we're seeing now from the Synod on Synodality and certainly the Synod underway in Germany. It's very much the case. You know, Bishop Batsing, who was the president of the Bishops' Conference, says he wants a new type of Catholicism, a Catholicism that's different. Well, wait a minute. If Catholicism is the true faith given to us by Jesus Christ, which it is, then we don't need a new version of that. We need to be more faithful to the existing mm. version. No, the political categories come up all the time when people who are faithful to the doctrine are labeled as rigid, intransigent in conservatives who are basically attached to things from the past because they're afraid of new things. This is nonsense. People who believe in the truth want to conserve what God gave us, but just not out of fear. The only fear we have is losing the faith or being unfaithful to God. But we have no fear of dealing with new questions. In fact, uh, that's one of the great things about the Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, uh, or Pope John Paul II, and I'm thinking to the back, uh, that they confronted modern questions right out in the open. Think about the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So this is where mm -hmm. uh, people using political categories are really misunderstanding the nature of faith. Mm. Uh, Benedict also addresses the suffering church today. Um, and I, they, well, I'll read this to you and tell you who I thought of as I read this. Uh, it is very important to contrast the lies and half-truths of the devil with the whole truth. Yes, sin and evil in the church are there. But even today, there is also the holy church that is indestructible. Even today, there are many men who humbly believe, suffer, and love and in whom the true God, the God that loves, is shown to us. Even today, God has his witnesses, martyrs in the world. We just have to be vigilant to see and hear them. Uh, Father, I, I couldn't help but think of Cardinal Joseph Zen uh, when I read this, uh, who I'm going to talk about a bit later, but your thoughts. Yes, I mean, we do have martyrs. We have people who are faithful and are in jail right now, particularly in Red China, uh, because they're faithful to the Catholic faith. Uh, this has been witnessed Africa, Asia. Uh, we have different martyrs uh, throughout the world as priests uh, are being killed in Nigeria uh, by Islamic forces, which are radical and hateful. Um, no, and then on the ordinary level, so many bishops and priests who remain faithful to the tradition of the church, unlike the majority of the German hierarchy, they're not interested in rejecting Christ's teaching about sexuality and creation. They want to uphold the faith. Right now, our bishops are going through a Eucharistic mm -hmm. revival in the United States, and I applaud them, because we need to love better the mm -hmm. gifts that God gave us, not throw God's teaching into the trash bin under the claim that we're irrelevant unless we adopt modern errors. Mm -hmm. I, I want to move on to a few other stories before we run out of time, and it's very related. Um, Vaticanista Sandro Magister uh, revealed this week that it was indeed the late Cardinal George Pell who wrote that anonymous memo uh, under the pseudonym uh, Demos, uh, critical explicitly of Pope Francis's pontificate. Father Jerry, is this surprising? And what does the tenor of Pell's memo tell us about the gravity of the situation? There were some who say this couldn't be Pell. He would never do this. He'd never say anything, you know, this uh, direct about the current pope's uh, pontificate or the way he was governing the church. Your thoughts when you, when you realized and read who the true author of this memo was? Yes, I trust Sandro Magister. He said that Pell handed him the document, so I believe that's what happened. Uh, Cardinal Pell did one, not want to publish it under his name, uh, but he wanted the message to go out. And, you know, uh, hmm. Pope Francis just gave a long interview to the AP in which he said he welcomes criticism, uh, in which he welcomes people, you know, revealing uh, what they think. Um, and let's just say this, 
Uh, Cardinal Pell expressed things that many other bishops and priests and even cardinals have said. I think back to the Dubia cardinals. They didn't say anything except yeah. pose questions, and they were rebuffed. They weren't even given the door, you know, shown uh, entrance into the Vatican Palace to speak to the Pope. So I would say that, you know, if there's dissatisfaction in an organization, the worst thing you do is try to clamp down on it and pretend everything's all right. The best thing you do is deal with the criticisms. And, you know, as regards this idea that this has been a catastrophic pontificate, well, let's argue it out based on facts, not the idea that you can't insult anybody and you can't insult the pope by questioning anything he does. You know, that's not an attitude of a mature person in dealing with problems. And we have serious problems in the church. You mentioned, I mentioned German bishops. This is driving me nuts. These bishops are trying to destroy Catholicism in their country, and uh, the Vatican better step on them because otherwise they're going to use their power and their money to afflict another religion on the Christians in Germany. This is very, very wrong. Yeah. Uh, well, after the damaging revelations uh, by Archbishop Gonswain, uh, Benedict's secretary, the Pell memo, and now the new Pope Benedict book, the, the posthumous book, Pope Francis this week gave an interview to the Associated Press's Nicole Winfield. Now, in it, he touches on a range of subjects. Um, I was fascinated by the timing of this, Father. Uh, it seems the Pope is trying to take control of the narrative again, because for the last few weeks, uh, you have voices from the grave <laughs> coming out and, and some living, uh, you, you know, posing challenges to the way in which he has been governing and leading the church in certain areas, not the pope himself, not the office, but the decisions made. Um, in this interview, he talks about the synodal way, homosexuality. I'm going to put this up on the screen. I'll read it to you. Uh, this is a bit of that interview the pope offered. He said, we are all children of God, and God loves us as we are, and for the strength that each one of us has to fight for our dignity. Being homosexual is not a crime. It is not a crime. Yes, but it's a sin. Well, yes, but let's make the distinction first between sin and crime. But it's also a sin to lack charity and with one another. So what about that? Every man and every woman must have a window in their life where they can turn their hope and where they can see the dignity of God. And being homosexual isn't a crime. It's a human condition. Father, uh, surely homosexuality is not a crime. But then the Pope says it is a sin, which is not exactly what the Church teaches. Clarify that. Yes, there's imprecise language here and confusion. Uh, sodomy is a sin. The misuse of the sexual organs uh, to seek venereal pleasure uh, in a way that's not uh, natural intercourse between a husband and a wife, that's what the sin is. It's clearly taught in the Bible and the natural law. Sodomy is a mortal sin. Now, laws against sodomy are designed to warn people not to commit that sin and to protect society where if that sin were tolerated, it might become more widespread. Uh, you know, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible is a warning to us. Now, the Pope, unfortunately, is becoming an advocate of decriminalization of anti-sodomy laws. And I, it's hard to believe that we would say that. In that same interview, uh, he quotes, uh, he's quoted as saying that you know, he knows African bishops are against changing those laws. He said they have to undergo a process of conversion. And I'm shaking my head. The people have to undergo conversion of those who want to commit sodomy, not the bishops who are telling them this is a sin, it's wrong, and the state should not legitimize it. So, you know, it, what is the basis where you would decriminalize sodomy? Do people have a right to commit sodomy? Is this somehow now a human right? That's what the left claims. The Catholic Church doesn't say that. Now, what about people who engage in prostitution? They're going to say, well, I, I don't like being stigmatized by laws that criminalize prostitution. Incest is against the law. People might say, well, that's consensual among adults. Why can't they do it? So a lot of confusion here. You know, I've worked with Courage over the years, and one of the most discouraging things that Courage members talk about is when the hierarchy doesn't teach the truth in a clear and understandable way. I mean, who's going to be happy with this decriminalization of sodomy? It's not that people who support church teaching. They're, they're stunned. The Pope, if anything, should be saying laws that lead people into sin should never become law. 
Mm. Uh, Father Jerry, I have to move on to another important um, moment here from this interview with the AP, where the Pope spoke about the synod, the upcoming synod that's been really dominating the news cycle in Catholicism for a number of years. He said this, the German experience does not help because it is not a synod. It is not a serious synodal path. It is a so-called synodal path, but not one with the totality of the people of God, but one made by the elites. But the German synodal experience is beginning or has begun in the bishoprics, like all the other synods, with the people of God, and it is moving forward. Here, the danger is that something very, very ideological trickles in. When ideology gets involved in church processes, the Holy Spirit goes home, because ideology overcomes the Holy Spirit. Father, the Pope, again, appears to denounce the German synodal way, yet it goes on. What effect will those words have both on the German synodal way and on the upcoming synod in Rome? Well, again, this is baffling and mystifying. If the Pope is against the German synodal way as an elitist ideological activity, he should have shut it down. The German bishops owe him the same obedience as any other bishops. If this is really so bad and hurting the church, it should have been shut down. Now, I wish it were shut down uh, because it is veering into a terrible direction. Uh, basically, the synod in Germany is uh, the synodal way as opposed to the synod on synodality, which is hard to distinguish. But the synodal way in Germany is basically a revolutionary movement to under, uh, change Catholic teaching on morality, anthropology, and the sacraments. And they're pushing women's ordination. So it, it's a horrible movement, and the majority of the bishops in Germany have endorsed it. This is an indictment of Vatican inaction. It's one thing to tell the German bishops, I don't like what you're doing. It's another thing to say, stop doing it. And the German synod, mm. synod on synodality, the separate process, if that's going to happen, they ought to shut this other one down. Because, you know, warnings about your elitist group of ideologues, they laugh that off. Batzing has already said they're going to form their synodal committee to start a synodal uh, consultation. Mm. They want to have a permanent parliament type thing where laity uh, would be uh, on equal footing with bishops to tell people what to do. This is horrible, but this is what's going on. Well, Father, I have to say, as I read those comments from the Pope, I thought, wait a minute, the, the synodal way undertaken in Rome is also has been controlled and the documents created by a small elite group of handpicked people. It's not like the entire church took part in this. I know there was the pro forma, oh, go poll all the dioceses. Literally infinitesimal percentages of people took part in that synodal way at the diocesan level. So the, the whole game is kind of like the German synodal way, and one gets the feeling that the ideology that the Pope rules and is concerned about in Germany might also be trickling into the global synodal way. I mean, you, you had Bishop McElroy here in the United States, Cardinal McElroy, uh, say one of the most difficult challenges they're going to have at this synodal way in Rome is dealing with female ordination. Uh, really? Uh, there's nothing difficult about that. It's already been answered. If you attempt to invalidly ordain a woman, you're excommunicated. Uh, the, that's the teaching of the church. That's canon law. You cannot change the nature of the sacraments because they are gifts from Christ to his church. Bishops and cardinals who say this is a problem, they're the problem for saying that. The problem is the rebellious element in the church which wants to overthrow Catholicism and replace it with a man-made religion. Uh, this is, that's mm. baffling to hear a cardinal say that. Doesn't he accept what canon law, what John Paul II, Benedict Paul VI, and every pope before them said? Pope Francis has likewise said in a recent interview, you can ordain women. So th this is ridiculous to keep bringing yeah. this up. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the synod, uh, Pope Francis has appointed a well-known uh, pro-LGBT priest to lead a retreat for bishops prior to the start of the next phase of the synod on synodality, English Dominican Father Timothy Radcliffe. He's expected to lead a three-day retreat in October to kick off the synod of bishops at the Vatican. Your thoughts on this appointment and uh, what message does that send? When you appoint someone who's publicly criticized the church's teaching on homosexual 
uh, activity uh, and, and that the church considers to be gravely sinful and immoral, when a person who doesn't agree with that is now going to be instructing in the spiritual life all the participants in the synod, you've made a terrible decision. And this is really scandalous. Uh, why can't we get a preacher who will simply teach the faith has been handed down from the apostles, including on this contested issue? You know, we've been discussing this for about a year, Raymond, on TV with the uh, papal posse, and all we're talking about every show is homosexuality, as if this is the most important problem in the life of the church. It's not. It's been made that way by those who want to change the church's teaching. Most Christians passive, pacifically, calmly accept the fact that sodomy is a mortal sin. They don't question that because that's what God teaches. Uh, finally, Pope Francis said in an AP interview that he was surprised, and I want your reaction to this. This is a story we've been covering, that he was surprised by the Father Rupnik scandal. Now, this was that Jesuit who was invited by the Pope to preach a Lenten retreat after he was excommunicated on allegations of sexual and religious abuse of nine, I believe, religious sisters. He says, the Pope, he had nothing to do with the way that was handled. Your reaction? Well, you know, he was excommunicated because he had absolved a, uh, an accomplice in a base sin, it's technically speaking, meaning he had sex with a, a, a religious sister and then gave her absolution. Mm -hmm. He was excommunicated. Right. Somehow that excommunication was overturned in the, in the quick pace of less than a month. Uh, and then he was accused a second time, this time of sexually abusing nine nuns. And what's going on here? The Pope says he wasn't involved in anything. Uh, wait a minute, Rupnik was there in your Vatican retreat uh, in between. You, you, that, you, know, you didn't have any hesitation, Holy Father, in bringing a known, uh, let's be blunt, the guy's a, a raping of nuns, that he's a guy to give her a spiritual conference in the Vatican. And didn't the Pope think that basically all this stuff might come out and it would be embarrassing? You know, Rupnik has not been thrown mm. out of the priesthood. I, this is un unbelievable. Uh, that this man is still right. exercising priestly mission in public. I know he's under restrictions, but he ignored those for a long time. It sends a terrible message mm. to the world that when nuns get taken advantage of by unscrupulous and evil priests, that the priests basically float over it, and then the hierarchy is not too worried. Mm. And then, you know, the, 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 the statute of limitations, which is regularly put aside, was not. So therefore, he got off scot-free because he committed these sins, you know, a long time ago. Big deal. Should uh, the McCarrick did should a the lot Pope of lift those? A long time ago. Should the Pope lift that statute of limitations and allow Rupnik to stand trial at the Vatican? At, Rupnik should stand trial tomorrow. They have enough evidence to convict this guy and throw him out, from based on what I know in public. And I'm sure their archives have a lot more information. If the one nun that who went public with a letter about what happened to her, mm -hmm. if her testimony were read in a co open court, there's no way Rupnik is going to get out of this. Uh, this is making us look ridiculous when personal friends of important people, including the Pope, somehow can float above the law, and then their victims are basically, you know, you have to be silent because, sorry, the statute of limitations uh, is in effect. No, they deserve their day in court. Mm. Heartbreaking story. Father, we will leave it there. You can find Father Jerry's commentary at thecatholicthing.org. Thank you, Father Jerry. Thank you, Raymond.